Uh, we may start, Dr. Nathan. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to this uh, pre-conference webinar. Uh, as you all are all familiar, we've got our 11th International Patient Safety Conference 2024 uh, being held in the uh, city of Bengaluru. Uh, this theme for this year is Futuristic Patient Safety. Uh, as we all through medical school and on our regular work are aware of this very important principle of do no harm. And that is what is the main purpose of patient safety conference that has been set up for many years now. Uh, during this event, we'll be having uh, proactive uh, discussions. We've got practice sessions uh, just to identify streamlined systems that can prevent patient risk. There are also going to be multidisciplinary sessions, shared views and enhancing knowledge. I would also would like to uh, invite you to register for your, there are a couple of workshops tomorrow. Uh, today's workshops obviously are done. We've got one on design thinking on patient safety and another one uh, design monitor, analyze and improve, which are the building blocks of safety in our healthcare environment, which we all know uh, is generally a dangerous place where errors can happen. Uh, we also have a webinar tomorrow, uh, which is around human human centered quality. So all our communication, empathy, uh, and those skills will be part of that webinar. So the registrations are still open for those. Uh, what we are going through today. Just get the slides on is uh, something like that, a disaster. So different types of disasters. So we really don't know when we are working in our healthcare environment, when a disaster would strike, uh, which would be some sort of an accident, which will stretch our resources. Uh, and that prepared, uh, being prepared for those sudden influx or sudden increased pressure on the same amount of resources is what we call as emergency preparedness. Uh, that's the webinar today where we are going to get you all ready, set, and safe to deal with these disasters. We've got a couple of eminent speakers. Uh, I'd just like to introduce them. Uh, we've got Professor Venkatesh A.N., who is uh, from Bangalore itself. He's a regional director. Uh, he's been working for many, many years, over two decades now. Uh, he's been part of the Semi, he is immediate past president over there. And we've also got uh, Dr. Emron Shuban, who will, who is the senior consultant head at Hyderabad Apollo. Uh, he's been executive chairman and chair of the WHO task force, uh, faculty for national disaster life support, and also the lead for the disaster response and planning. So we'll have um, Dr. Venkatesh talk to us about various aspects of uh, setting up planning for a disaster preparedness or an emergency preparedness in the healthcare environment. And then Dr. Imran will take us through various uh, drills or other uh, activities, how we can test ourselves so that we are actually, you know, prepared to deal with that kind of an emergency. So I'll stop sharing now and I'll hand it over to Dr. Venkatesh. Welcome, Dr. Venkatesh. If I can invite you to share your screen and uh, share your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you, Nitin. I'll be just sharing it now. Please make your PPT as full screen, Dr. Ventish. Yeah. Now it's visible? Not yet. You need to go into slideshow. Yeah. Yes. Looks good. Hi. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Okay, so now we are going to talk on the disaster management. 
So the word disaster, it's derived from the French word des and aster. Des means bad, bad and aster means a star. So nothing but disaster means it's a bad star. As we are all familiar, it starts, the star, if the stars are bad, bad things happen which affect large group of people. When the event is big, affecting a community or a region, it is said to be a major disaster, like floods, hurricanes, or earthquakes. So to understand the topic better, we need to familiarize ourselves with some words like hazard, vulnerability, capacity, and risk, to name a few. What do we mean by a hazard? Hazard is a phenomenon or a situation which has the potential to cause disruption or damage to people, their property, their services, and, and the environment. In the recent years, we hear about different types of hazard like natural disaster and man-made disasters. The natural disasters are the one which we are more familiar, which have been happening since Earth began. As seen here, some of the hazards due to forces of natural, which is a nature or like earthquake, the floods, the tsunami, and thunderstorms. These hazards affect us in varying uh, severity from localized destruction to widespread effects. Now, looking at the man-made hazards, there are hazards due to activities of man, which has led widespread illness or adverse effects in the community like air pollution, uh, due to industries and automobiles, causing breathing difficulty in many major cities. Our other examples are improper waste disposal, pollution of water resources and radiation hazards. Now, looking at the vulnerability, vulnerability means the conditions or sets of condition that reduces people's ability to prepare for, withstand or respond to a hazard. It is basically the condition which puts person or place at risk of adverse effects from the hazard, like uh, being on the river banks, which will have a risk of floods, being on the seashore, which will have a risk of tsunami, and earthquake prone areas are vulnerable uh, for earthquakes. These are the conditions lead to worse effects due to hazard. Now looking at vulnerable, so here we can see the relation between the hazard and vulnerability. Hazard by itself is not harmful like the shark is seen here. If it is in the open waters, similarly if there is an overflow of the river in unpopulated places, it may not be of any significance. When we have a person swim in water close to the shark, either the shark come near the sh uh, shore or a person is swimming in deep waters, the person is at risk of hurt from the shark. The person is vulnerable for shark attack. So when both of these conditions come together, we have a disaster, the shark eating the man. But it's not so simple. The, these are next few words like capacity and risk, which help understand disasters better. What is capacity? It is the positive condition or abilities which increases a community's ability to deal with hazard. As we see in the picture, if there are only a limited number of uh, fishes in the bowl, all of them will be okay. But if the number increases, then the capacity, the top ones will fall off and disaster for those fishes. It's an example. So let us see what is risk. It is the probability that a community structure or geographic area is to be damaged or disrupted by the impact of a particular hazard on an account of their nature, construction, and proximity to a hazardous area. It means that if we have built a house or on a hilltop at the edge of a cliff for a beautiful views and nature, there will be a risk of house collapsing in the event of a landslide. So now if we put all these together, we can have a bigger picture. This, capacity, this can be represented by this equation. The risk of disaster increases directly in relation to a hazard and vulnerability. That is, if the hazard increases or vulnerability increases, the risk of disaster is also increases. For example, if there is a very heavy rains, which will be hazard, or if you lay very close to a river bank, which will be vulnerability, the risk of you being affected by the floods will be very high. 
Now, if you see, if you have the capacity to build a strong tall houses or build house on a high ground or a build a, a flood barrier, which uh, the risk of a disaster will be reduced. So the capacity increases, the risk of disaster also decreases. Now that we know, for example, now we can see that we know that the disaster risk is dependent on hazard and vulnerability. We have some tools which will help us to calculate the risk of disaster. This will also help us to build out the capacity to reduce the risk of those disaster as seen from the above equation. So this is a tool which is going to help you people to assess what, how we are going to uh, plan our disaster plan in our surrounding area of our hospital sector. So this is an example of a hazard vulnerability assessment tool in, which is done in our hospital. So this takes into account the location of the hospital, the surrounding structure, which helps us to calculate the vulnerability. We have a major metro construction example. We have a major metro construction which is happening uh, opposite to our hospital. So there is a probability the structure can collapse and can lead to one of the disaster. And surrounding our hospital, it can be there will be more uh, road uh, traffic accidents, or there can be uh, some fire hazards, which is common in this locality. This area is not prone for earthquakes or tsunami or a floods because this is uh, uh, not uh, near to the NEC. So you need to assess the plans as per your area of location and the surrounding uh, structures and possibility in the last few years what all the disasters happen and according to that you can put a scoring and then come to conclusion uh, which is going to be helpful for uh, planning for your uh, disaster plans and drills. So the first phase of action after a disaster will be a response to a disaster. This will depend on the type of external disaster like the, there are forest fires. The response would be to get the fire under control. If it is an earthquake, the response would be to ensure safe evacuation of the people and identify people trapped in the debris. So next, the relief measures or the phase is to attend to the survivors of disaster. In this phase, we work on the basic needs of providing the food, shelter and health care. Health care for the injured and also to work on measures to prevent further infections and communicable diseases. Here we can see some of the other phases following a disaster, that's recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. As the relief measures are ongoing, the recovery phase starts. This is a part where we understand the process to restore the uh, disaster level. So uh, the rehabilitation is a crucial part of recovery. The rehabilitation has many aspects like rehabilitation of health, the home, the economy, and community as a whole. So many times rehabilitation may be a temporary arrangement. The reconstruction phase uh, uh, is the one in which we work for rebuilding and repairing the damages due to disaster. So we have two words, rehabilitation and reconstruction. So you can see in this uh, pictorial, the rehabilitation is a temporary repair to the damage due to disaster, while reconstruction is a complete process and sometimes more time consuming than a rehabilitation. So the next phase is the preparedness and mitigation phase. In this phase, we work towards preparing to face the oncoming uh, disaster and also to minimize the adverse effects due to disaster. As we see here, wearing masks during the COVID times was an example of preparedness to be able to continue to carry on with day-to-day -day living while facing the danger of infection. So in the next picture, we see construction of a river bank enforcement to mitigate the risk of flooding. So prevention is the next phase, like we see the picture where there, is a, there are medical camps to prevent the hazard of a communicable diseases and use of widespread awareness and preventive measures. So this is a representation of a disaster cycle showing all phases in disaster management uh, uh, cycle. 
So in the example of a flood disaster, the picture we can see measures taken in preparedness during the event of a flood, like spreading the news, having enough storage of a uh, home of essentials, having adequate helpline numbers, etc. The mitigation factors would be building flood barrier and building homes at a higher level than the water. So the prevention measures example will be like construction of dams, which can control the water flow and help to prevent the floods in low-lying areas. So if we see some of the number, there were only 39 natural disasters recorded in 1960, while this number has increased 10 times to 396 in 2019. Just from 1990 to 2019, in a span of 20 years, there were more than 9,924 disaster, natural disasters recorded. So it goes on without saying that as the number of disasters are increasing, so it is the number of casualties from these events. In 1980, the approximate uh, cost for disaster is $50 billion, which has increased fourfold to $200 billion in the uh, last decade. So in uh, 1980, so you can see the number, how it is increasing and the preparedness, how we have to plan for this. So this is a graphic representation of our disasters across the world in last century. From the 1960s, we see progressive increase in the number of natural disaster events. In the last two decades, we have about 350 to 400 natural disasters across the world each year. So this is about one natural disaster, so almost like uh, uh, one natural disaster every day. So this is a representation of various types of nat natural disasters across the world. As we see, there is no one type of disaster. It's lack of water causing drought disaster in some places, while it is the excess of water causing floods in others. As health sector, we need to be trained and prepared for any and all types of eventuality for, uh, for these disasters. So this is a bar chart representation of natural disasters across the world in comparison to our country, India. Though the number of events look small due to density of population, the number of casualties are very high. So India is vulnerable to disaster due to the following condition. 58.6% of land mass is prone for earthquake. So which uh, framing is a majority industries and many families depend on farming. So they are prone for drought, causing misery to large uh, group of population. In contrast, there are vast areas lying in a river belts, which is 12% making them to, uh, prone for floods. So as we have seen, the natural disaster can bring a large number of patients to hospitals. It may not be possible to deal with such situation without proper planning, and training. Hence, we need to conduct periodic simulation drills. At Apollo, we have our disaster management plan written down and it is used to run uh, the simulation. So you can see this is a list of contents listing the requirement for the drill and in case of disasters, respond to the plan and to the event. So you need to plan, uh, make a disaster plan with the following contents and hours required uh, according to your uh, hospital sector. So what is the purpose? Purpose is to ensure a hospital-wide plan to respond to manage emergencies like epidemics, disasters, which may affect the hospital. We respond to any natural disaster also like natural or man-made or accidents or how we can uh, uh, the reason forget about the uh, COVID pandemic. So we need to think what is a natural or a man-made or transport disasters, which is gonna affect our surrounding hospitals and we have to make a plan as per that. So what is the goal? The goals are to evaluate the process of disaster response preparedness across the hospital. It will look like uh, into all aspects like a triage, it can be communication, the lab response, the security, our bed uh, capacity. So we need to plan as per this. We have seen earlier, we also calculate the hazard vulnerability assessment to identify the risk locally so that we can plan better. So as this exercise involves the response to a whole hospital, a lot of people are involved. To maintain a system and order, there is a chain of uh, command or line of authority 
which we can, uh, the commander, the chiefs, the directors, and leaders. A command nucleus is created with the pre-designed members of a hospital who will be involved in taking major decision during the uh, response. So we can see the lines of authority. First is lines of authority, and then we need to plan the command nucleus who's going to take a call for uh, announcing the uh, disaster. So some of these, uh, uh, the options of list of command, see, we need to plan first who is going to be on the command nucleus. So each hospital, they have their own uh, set of people, starting as a CEO or executive director. So who is going to be a top authority. And as disasters will be managed mainly in the emergency departments, so you need to involve the emergency head as uh, one of the person where they can, and also the medical director or medical superintendent. So you need to plan who is on first on call and the second on call because disasters can happen any time of the day or any time of the night. So first plan, and this requires the whole set of people in the hospital starting. It can be the nursing or logistics, safety, security, the emergency department, the ICUs, your uh, ancillary services, radiology, uh, billing. So marketing, everybody should be planned and you need to put who is on first on call and if there is no, you're not able to connect. So you need to plan for who is second on call. So this is a list like you need to just make a list with their mobile numbers or speed dials, whatever options, and keep it ready right now so that everyone should know where it should they should be contacting whom. So it's always a good practice to have a list of command nucleus. In today's time, the communication is very, very important tool in terms of disaster. It can, you can have an external communication or an internal communication. So you need to plan as per what external communication facilities are there with you and an internal communication, what all the things which you are going to be uh, responsibility for using during the disaster. So when there is already a panic and cause, Due to disaster, many miscommunication can create further uh, 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 damages. So all communication are done only by a designated person as listed. So once you plan for a, a basic plan, your HVA is done, then you need to have a flow chart how we are going to be uh, activating the uh, uh, disaster drill. So again, this will be expl explained by Dr. Imdar, the next speaker, how you're going to do your activation process. And also the code activation process, uh, uh, they will be taken care of by the next speaker. So first is how to make a plan. So you need to plan as per your hospital capability. So some hospitals will be 100 bed, 200 bed, 500 bed, 1000 beds. So first you need to see how much capacity when there is a, when a sudden surge of patients comes to your hospital, you are able to manage. So first plan according to that. So in our hospital, we have divided into category A, category B, C, and D. So first we divided into, if there are 10 to 20 patients, we will take it consider as category A, if it is 21 to 30 B and 31 to 40 C and more than 40 is D. So in our hospital, we have a capacity of uh, catering maximum around 40 patients when sudden surge of uh, patients come into our hospital. So this has to be planned as per your uh, emergency department, your daycare center, or your ICUs, or and your OT capacity. So you need to plan as per this, then only you need to go for the next. So some hospital can cater only 20 patients. So you divide the plans, and number two is you need to plan when you are going to announce a disaster. So it can be like code red or whatever the codes which you uh, plan in your hospital. So like if there are four or five patients, which is your routine, which they come, you don't require to announce a disaster. So you need to plan. So in our hospital, if more than 11 patients come, we plan to announce a disaster because it requires a lot of support and manpower across the hospital for coordinating. So we have, you need to plan a schematic diagram. If there are, in a plan A, if there are 10 patients or 15 patients come at a time, you need to plan where you are going to create a red zone, your yellow zone, your green zone, and your black zone. So you need to plan as per uh, the schedule. So if there is here, you can see a, a diagram here. In the plan A, 
So we have divided uh, where is going to be the uh, uh, red zone. It's in the emergency department and also yellow zone inside the ER. As it is completely full, we plan the green zone into the cardiology, cardiology area where outpatients can be seen and the orange zone. So initial, when the patient comes, you need to plan how we are going to triage. So that will be with your orange zone. So first triage the patients and send them to appropriate area. If the patient is very critical and triage one area, send them to the red zone area. If the patient can, and it has to be treated immediately. So if the patients are with the yellow zone where it can be waited uh, for a doctor's or other investigation for 45 to 50 minutes or an hour, you can send them to yellow zone. And if the patient is stable enough where it can be seen even in one or two hours later as an outpatient, it can be sent to the green zone. And if there is any patient is deceased, you need to send them to the uh, black zone or a mortuary area, whatever facility you have. So like that, you need to plan and also you need to decide how many junior medical staff you're going to put here, your housekeeping, your nursing, your executives, how many stretchers are required, your wheelchairs are required, how many disaster kits which is filled with the uh, uh, medications you need to decide and then you need to plan according to that. So this is as per the plan C and again the uh, plan D. So likewise, the number of uh, expected, whatever the numbers, you need to decide how you are going to plan and which area is going to be decided because it's very important. You need to plan before the disaster drill is announced so that you can demarcate the area and make it a color coded so that even if the emergency doctors are busy, anybody who look at the color code they can easily plan uh, for shifting to that uh, particular areas. So these are a few examples where the drills are being done. You can see the ambulances are coming, how it has been managed in the pre-hospital care. So next you need to decide how the protocols have been done in each area. So what is your protocols in uh, the orange zone? Uh, orange zone is typically a triage area. So they are triaged and shifted to the respective zone according to their triage category. So executives will collect the demographic uh, details and the patients will have a tag. You need to create a tag, ID tag, which will reflect if it is to be shifted on a red zone or a yellow zone or a green zone or a black zone. So by looking at the uh, uh, color, they will be shifting to that particular uh, triage area. So some patients who are dead, then you can be making them with a uh, 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 black zone, black tag, and which can be shifted to the mortuary area. So what are the protocols? So red zone we consider mainly as uh, who need immediate intervention to save a life or a limb and secondary to, uh, secondary survey shall be done, the responsibility of the receiving units. So your immediate life-threatening events to be tackled in the uh, uh, triage area and in the red zone, then you can shift to the particular area where they will go with a secondary survey and you need to continue. So the primary survey is very important and life-threatening emergency should be managed. And you need to plan what basic investigations you are going to be doing there and need to basic areas like the informing the blood bank, informing the OT. So these all should be planned in the red zone and should be manned documentation, important documentation should be managed. And later, if there is a road traffic accident or any other disaster, medical legal documentation is mandated, which can be done later. So next coming patients who are injured and need medical attention, but not critically injured and shifted to this zone, which is not, which doesn't require immediate care, but can be seen a little later. So these patients are also assessed symmetrically with airway breathing and circulation. So the required medical management is started, investigations are requested and the patients who are stable and once it is stabilized can be stepped down and or discharged can also be done so. So here there are patients executive who would man maintain patient records and update the command as required. So this is a zone what we call is walking wounded. Patients who need minimal medical attention and can be discharged with follow-up advice. Investigations and intravenous are done in this area as required. So here also executive will keep the records of the patient and they will ensure complete documentation of any patients who are discharged and update the command nucleus as required. So the deceased are coded black and shifted to the mortuary. 
A marchery can also hold up to some three bodies. So depending on your uh, institutions, you can plan how many you can uh, hold it. Or if there are more, you need to create a, a mixed zone, uh, uh, black, black zone, so that you can keep uh, there and uh, uh, with the security uh, guarding that area. So this is very important and the documentation need to be maintained and an executive can manage all the documentation and also need to update uh, the command nucleus because this also need to update sometimes to the uh, uh, the patient authority, patient relatives, and also to media if the, the people are around. So this is a simple list of things, the material which can be used during the code read. This can be different for uh, different places. So you need to plan as per your requirement. You can plan what all the uh, requirement. The basic will be your uh, ID tags, which, which with all the zones ID tags and the number sticker sheet, uh, permanent black markers, which is all important because suddenly during the disaster, it will be, it'll be so uh, uh, disturbed, we can't make out get the things. So make a plan, keep all things in a kit and name it as a disaster kit and store uh, at least like five patients' medications in your kit, which you can plan suddenly when there is a surge of patient, you can use the disaster kits and you can take other help from the pharmacy as and when required. When you plan, if the disaster comes and then you plan for doing all this, it's going to be very difficult to save anybody's life. And the drill requirement, always it is planned to uh, have twice uh, drills in a, in, in, a, in a year so that uh, in a hospital you can plan for the external disaster, which will also be briefed by the next speaker. So you, you can think in terms of it's not only the uh, uh, external drills, uh, external uh, disaster, what happens, you have seen the epidemic drills is also one of the thing. Epidemic disasters are also common. So you need to plan yourself to have, if there is a sudden surge of epidemic, like what the COVID happened, you need to plan as per that sudden surge of 20 patients come with the, some communicable diseases. How we are going to manage, how we are going to plan. If there is more than 30 patients come, but your capacity is only around 20 patients, you need to plan yourself to have a MOU with the surrounding hospitals or in nursing homes so that additional extra patients, whatever come to plan for shifting. So please have this drill regular, create more number of patients so that you can plan what is my our capacity. If there is more surge of patient, where exactly I can shift them immediately and make them to save their life. <clears throat> so as per the National Disaster, uh, Disaster Management Plan, so you can see the act. First is always you need to, the NDMA, uh, the National Disaster Management has created the policy of a disaster management across and they will be testing. So their, their uh, uh, thing is to lay down the policies, approve the National Disaster Management Plan and the ministries uh, who are all going to be involved. So these are all planned as the National Disaster uh, uh, NDMA. So like that, you need to have a plan as per your hospital sector who is going to be a command nucleus. So again, the same, we have a state disaster management authorities, which will be planning when there is a sudden surge of uh, disasters happen across the state. So they have their own policy and they have their plans and they have their people and what they also have the funds which require to help uh, during the disaster management. And same way, there is also a district uh, disaster management authorities. So when you have, you can go to these websites and see how they have also done which is also going to benefit for your people for planning your disaster. So coming to the summary, the disaster response is an emergency condition involving multiple specialities and multiple departments. So disasters affect in various ways of health is one of the aspect. So disaster can be of a wide spectrum and due to various causes, it can be natural, it can be man-made, it can be infection related. So Periodic drills helps us to respond to event in systemic, uh, systematic manner. These drills also help us to work on any improvements and updates required as shown by the evaluation of the drill. So there are no one set of rules. Each set will be needed to work on their own plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Venkatesh. That was a... Uh, quite a detailed uh, description about how we should prepare. Uh, I can move on to invite uh, Imran to go through how we can 
uh, take this further and check whether our plan is going to work. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, everyone can see my uh, screen, hopefully. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just uh, give you a short uh, summary on how you test your disaster plans. Um, normally, it takes a, a couple of days to help people understand how to test their whole capacity. So it's very difficult to put it uh, so quickly, but I've done my best to uh, give you a summary so that you can understand. Um, back in a few years ago in Hyderabad, our our doctors team, they did a survey across uh, the entire Hyderabad city on how many hospitals had disaster plans. So almost all said yes out of the approximately 30 hospitals which we had uh, surveyed. And uh, we asked them, can you show the drill copy? And only two were able to show, which was one was our hospital, the other was the command hospital, which was present. So usually disaster plans are always on paper. They are not produced properly. They are not uh, implemented properly. They are not tested properly. So testing your disaster plans is very important. Uh, if there is a disaster, God forbid, for which your hospital is unable to handle it is immediate destruction of the brand. So the impact of mismanaging a disaster is, is quite huge. Both individuals as well as the company itself will be put down and it's very difficult to recover from it. So uh, we right now I'm assuming that all who are listening are part of uh, uh, very well-developed hospital systems where they have these disaster plans in place. So I'm assuming that you have some sort of a plan and uh, you want to know how uh, we are actually testing those plans. See, testing is very important because when disaster actually strikes, we need to perform flawlessly. There will be errors which happen, but it will still be very, very low. If you haven't planned, it will always be chaos. If you haven't tested, it is always chaos. So how do we test these plans? So very, very broad differentiation. Whenever we respond, our ambulance teams are the ones which respond in the field. So you should be able to check your pre-hospital response. See, you cannot escape because uh, government authorities, police, anyone can request for help at the disaster scene. It can be a factory, it can be a, a, a bus disaster on the road. So you will have to, you will be responding to the field. You will be transporting patients from one location to your hospital. So that response has to be tested. And of course, in hospital response, this you should be familiar with uh, where you'll be checking this. So those uh, most of the hospital leadership, they don't go out in the field to see what happens. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of processes. A uh, lot of rules and regulations apply uh, in the pre-hospital space when you are responding. Your vehicles are moving about. You have a complex team of paramedics. Uh, you may have external uh, volunteers which don't belong with you, with whom you have to work with. You have to work with government authorities. And of course, the same differentiation of zones, triaging, uh, roles and responsibilities all happens in the field. So this has to be tested very, very carefully and measured against a standard. And then you, you can be sure that something uh, uh, that things are working out well. So pre-hospital is a very important uh, uh, component which I would like to bring your attention that you must test it properly uh, before you say your entire disaster plan is uh, working well. You can inform and then test the plans, which is the most common. 99.9% .9 we will inform everyone that on Monday at 1 p.m. we have a disaster drill. Please be ready. We'll be activating code red. But there is also unannounced drill which you can do. Now, unannounced drills should be done only when you are when you are confident that your uh, drills are working well and your processes are working well. And then suddenly you can announce that there is a, a, a disaster which has happened and everyone should respond. So unannounced drill take people by surprise, but they should not panic and they should function exactly the same way as in an uninformed drill. 
so i would suggest that uninformed drills be done if you are ready to uh, uh, i mean if you are all confident of handling things uh, the full plan can be tested or you can test individual components of the plan once in a year uh, our hospital because of the jci standard we do a full plan activation where every uh, component of the disaster plan is tested on the same day in the same event but you can also do modular checking you can just do emergency medicine department you can just do ambulance field checking you can just test the command nucleus or the hospital and command and control how they function to a to a simulated disaster scenario where only the hospital command and control members have to give answers to different questions so like this modular testing also can be done and you can record this pharmacy only nursing only so you can test that so here in the photograph you can see that we are testing just the emergency department nurses in their triaging abilities so we have laid out about 20 uh, dummies there and papers you can see the victims written there and we are testing their uh, triaging abilities so this was just a triage test for the emergency department staff first was nurses then was doctors then was paramedics so we this is something like one component of the disaster drill is what we are uh, testing here we are testing uh, just how the zones are being managed so within the uh, uh, simulated space this is just a hall inside our emergency where we have simulating how the patients are receiving and what the doctors are doing and what the nurses are doing so again they are supposed to triage retriage the patient they should take them appropriately in different uh beds then they should find the beds they have to inform the code red coordinator they have to call the appropriate specialist they have to find the drugs and equipment required to manage that patient so all this is being tested only in this particular module so this is the examples of how modular testing can be uh, done so again testing can be actual live testing or you can do tabletop or virtual type of testing so again once in a year we do actual live testing with volunteers so volunteers are put out in the field and then we simulate that something has happened there and our ambulances all will actually respond driving and then bringing the patients here so that's example of a live testing so you can instead of doing a live you can always do a table top or a virtual ex, uh, testing so this is example of a live testing when we were uh, participating with the airport for the drill where there were drums of diesel which was put and they simulated an aircraft crash so this is a live testing where you have to put out the fire you have to actually be careful in how you are approaching that location our ambulances have safety issues there are hazards present there and then uh, uh, volunteers are brought in like uh, injured victims and then we manage this the same thing can be done in your on inside your consultation room itself so this is inside the emergency we are doing a table top where we have simulated a uh, a uh, uh, lorry crash using toys so we are showing the victims here we are showing that there are fire rescue vehicles and your six ambulances have arrived tell me how will you move the patients so each person who is responsible should clarify what they will do at this location what is the first step they will do what is the second step they will do so this is how table tops are uh, executed so another uh, example of how you test disaster plans is most of the time again 99.9% we do testing only during duty hours so when everybody is there we do informed and we do duty hours everything goes well and we are feeling very happy disasters don't come during duty hours they can come any time so they can come on a sunday they can come on diwali day on a festival day they can happen at 3 am in the night they can happen when you are on leave so how will your hospital respond so off duty testing is also very very critical that you uh, uh, know how your uh, disaster plan will respond so this is example of a, we have done a night drill we did at 10:30 pm which lasted till midnight uh, where the field response was checked during the night so there were some unique requirements there we couldn't see the patient so they needed big lights to illuminate the zones which were provided by the airport services then our doctors needed flashlights so you can see on the helmets we had flashlights which were kept there so these are unique requirements which will come in during the night so again only by testing you will find uh, these kind of uh, issues 
So responding departments like uh, Dr. Venkatesh had spoken. We have responding departments. That's why testing is very, very important. And when you look at each individual department, this is a huge number of people. These are massive teams which are there, which have their own hierarchy, which have their own rules and regulations, and they have to function properly during a disaster. So that's why testing is a very, very high priority whenever you have your disaster plans. So this is an important slide. Now I'm showing you just the joint commission standards, which some of the hospitals within Apollo and others have. Uh, you may have NABH standards, which will be there. You may have QAI standards. You may have some other standards, but it's very important to benchmark your plan against a particular standard. It's not just random that I feel it is good or I feel it has worked or my boss said it is it works very well. It's not like that. You always have to take a particular defined standard and the latest one. So you can see here determining the likelihood consequences of hazards is a very important thing, which Dr. Venkatesh had shown. You need to have uh, 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 predicted uh, issues which should be listed out properly. You need to identify your structural, non-structural vulnerabilities which are there in the patient care environment. You have to plan for alternative sources of power and water. This was a good example. In a disaster situation like an earthquake, you will lose power. You will, you will, your water sources will get disrupted because the roads are damaged. So how long will you supply your patients with water and power? So it's an important question. And then determining hospital role during disaster, what will your hospital exactly do? What is that which is defined clearly? What are your communication strategies? How do you manage your clinical activities? Again, is an important standard. Identifying staff roles and responsibilities. And uh, one of the unique ones which is inside JCI is when a staff is unable to work during your disaster, what will you do? So if, if I have to cannot work in the hospital during a disaster and I have some other thing to attend to. So what happens at that time? So these are the definitions. So you can see here, uh, this is an example of a disaster drill which we have done in the field. So you can see the staff and our ambulances responding. So they'll go to a location and then we will carry a lot of disaster kits. So what are we testing here? We are testing our ambulance response time. We are testing whether our vehicles can uh, sufficient vehicles can respond during a disaster. See, if we have four vehicles and they're already moving with patients, how will they respond to our disaster? So this is what we are testing here. Do we have sufficient doctors to leave their positions and go into disaster? That is what we are testing. Do we have sufficient kits which can be carried to the field? What is present inside the kit? So this is what we are testing in EMS response whether our teams are actually triaging properly, whether they're identifying the sickest patients properly, whether they are being moved first, whether somebody is overriding, all this is being tested. And the safety of the patients, the safety of the staff is again tested here. So everything has to be uh, looked into whenever you're testing your individual plans. So there are different standards which apply what to observe, what to check, what to uh, look at. When they arrive into the hospital again, uh, who is receiving them near the door, how they are being triaged, how they are being transported. So you can see that uh, one of the one patient is being transported here with the safety belts put. So all this is being checked. You can't risk patient safety uh, because you are transporting very quickly during a disaster. So are the doctors formed a triaging unit? Are they triaging properly? Uh, whether the nurses are able to receive, whether you have sufficient beds to receive these patients, where are you moving the other patients who are already present there? How are you handling the non-disaster patients? If someone comes with chest pain or stroke during a disaster response, who handles them? How do you take care of them? See, all this is being tested during the uh, drill. So whether your clinical teams are responding, whether your surgeons, whether your radiologists, uh, whether your anesthesia doctors are coming immediately, all this is being tested. You're checking their times. You're checking whether the consultants are arriving here, how long they are taking. Now, each of these people will start asking, I want a cervical collar. I want fluids. I want antibiotics. I want splints. I want blood. Is all those available when they ask for? Again, these are the questions which you are trying to answer when during your testing. 
So are your administrative teams helping you? Whether they are coming in, whether they are helping you move the beds, whether they are freeing the beds, whether they are cancelling the uh, operation, uh, the uh, elective OTs, whether they are keeping stuff, do you have transport stuff? Do you have people to handle media uh, uh, problems? Security is a nightmare in India because one patient will receive about 50 to 60 attenders along with their vehicles, which will start parking outside. So again, this is a nightmare, they, whether they're working with the police to handle that. So all this is what being tested in your uh, drills. So how do you actually document? I have some screenshots here from, uh, from one of our uh, assessment forms. So this is what we will be testing. So if I am an observer, uh, testing uh, this drill. So I'm going to, I have certain questions which I need answers for from the drill. So when did the drill begin? Who declared it? Where did, uh, where did the first call land? Uh, well, was the hospital command and control operational as soon as this information came in? Uh, whether the zones were ready to accept victims? Where this victim screen for communicable diseases is, and was an important question about few years ago. Now, it still is important right now. Uh, sufficient doctors, nurses, are they available to participate in the drill? Then this is very important. Was the code red stand uh, announcement loud and clear? Very, very common not to hear. Very, very common that the person is very soft. He has not communicated at all through the hospital. So the activation fails. So this is an important question. Then were communication devices used during the drill? Uh, whether zones were receiving updates? Were there any type of delays which were uh, uh, created? Then whether radios were reduced? See, there are so many questions just on radios. Whether radio, uh, were there any technical errors? Whether radio language was correct when people were using them? Whether, whether there was any crosstalk? So these are a lot of questions which are checking your communication strategies here. Um, then whether sufficient number of doctors were available uh, to respond during the drill, whether nurses are sufficient, whether social workers arrived in time, whether our kits were available, oxygen cylinders, drugs, then food and water. So these are specific questions which the observer, if you or me are observers, we have to spend some time to understand what is exactly going on before we answer yes or no to this question. If we feel oxygen cylinders were insufficient, we have to write there that they were insufficient and our supply was compromised due to certain things. And what did the team do when they identified that there was lack of resources? So this is how the questions go on. Uh, PPE, alternative sources of power, uh, water, all these things should be checked. Now, for example, alternative source of power, how, how do I check is if I'm going to tell that, uh, I'll tell the maintenance manager that there was no power. So how long does your generator run on? So they'll be able to tell me the hospital can run on this generator for so many hours. Then I ask them, where is your fuel and how long your fuel uh, su supplies are there to run this hospital? So, and I write down there. So this is how you have to identify uh, 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 weaknesses in your uh, plan. Uh, some more questions, eye protection, personal protective equipment questions. If there is an infectious patient, whether they were isolated, yes, no. So these are some of the questions. Uh, was there any kind of problems with the admitted patients, whether ICU beds were available, uh, whether the patients, the other patients were explained why chaos is going on, because you're going to throw out all your existing patients and to free the beds. So you have to give them information, who is taking responsibility for all those things. Uh, were overcapacity plans available? Dr. Venkates spoke about overcapacity plans. So again, that is an important uh, component which needs to be tested. So did all the departments, all areas respond correctly, whether security and others managed everything properly? Did all the staff uh, know their roles and responsibilities? These are the things which will come out in your uh, uh, end of the drill discussion and debrief meetings. So, uh, and I pointed out that if any staff is unable to perform duty, uh, what solution was available? So we always simulate a couple of staff who will tell that uh, my family is affected with this disaster and I cannot work here, I have to go there. So when they leave their positions, how do you 
uh, what did the HR do or what did the code red coordinator do with such a problem? So again, these are all documentation. So this is the example of how questions will come during your testing. And this is the official document which you have to uh, fill. The end of the day, we are trying to find out what went wrong, what scope for improvement and how to fix the problems which we have found. So some of the examples of uh, real life findings which uh, we have handled here uh, is the failure of announcement. Our ceiling speakers were not working properly. Uh, some departments could not hear. For example, OT could not hear. Pharmacy could not hear uh, the code red announcement. So those things had to be fixed. The first uh, vehicle which went to the field, they did not communicate how many uh, victims were present and how many were arriving. So failure of communication of the disaster was a, a real problem which we found. We frequently face issues related to triaging. Triaging errors happen continuously. Uh, sometimes patient get missed. The patient was there in the field. He was in the ambulance, but we don't know where is he in the hospital. So we tend to miss out on patients because of the high uh, intensity flow. So that is a very common thing. And uh, media mismanagement is again a very, very common problem where media uh, personnel get in and they don't know what to do. They have free hand in the research station area, taking photos, videos, talking to everyone, which must be restricted uh, because of patient confidentiality. So these are the examples of uh, uh, testing. So I hope I have given you a good uh, overview of uh, 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 how to test uh, uh, drills, uh, your plans. So I hope you would go back and start reviewing what you have already done and uh, hope that uh, you can test them a little more uh, so that they are uh, in perfect situation. So thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Imran. Um, so I think well, that was a very good description of a hospital setup doing repeated drills and repeated testing in multiple environments, both pre-hospital, in-hospital, and uh, various types. So uh, like everything in healthcare, most of the things are cyclical. So uh, we're waiting for any questions in the chat box. In the meantime, I would just like to summarize what Venkatesh and Imran have very nicely described is this disaster management cycle, which uh, you can see on the screen. Uh, there is a preparation phase, which includes your uh, assessment, what risk you're uh, likely to face, what is the probability, and that is how you'll design your plan, you'll create that plan, you'll train people how they'll respond, and then if you're unlucky, you will have an event or you create your own event, which is what we call a mock drill, and then we test our response. Uh, we test our recovery, uh, which was again demonstrated very well and mitigation factors and we evolve that plan again so whatever we have learned from the findings of the mock drill we apply that we evolve the disaster plan and test it again and the cycle goes on and that is how we will continuously be prepared uh, as you know there are different disasters at different times with technology now uh, lots of things can be very different uh, just having a look at the chat box. Do we have any questions? Okay. Just give people a minute. If you want to type any questions into the chat box for any of the speakers. No questions at the moment. So there's one appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Imran, sir. Thank you for detailed description of disaster plan testing. Uh, so I would like to end the session by thanking both Venkatesh and Imran uh, for 
a great presentation which highlighted all the various aspects and uh, we'll see you guys at the conference in a couple of days thank you nitin yeah thank you, thank you to meet all of you thank you thank you dr sanjay thank you dr ventesh dr imran and dr nitin thanks